Good morning, everybody. This is Danny back from Deep South Homestead. Guys, today, let's talk organic farming. Let's talk about what it really is, what it's not. Before we actually get into the series, I'm going to try to do, if the Lord's willing, about organic farming and how to really do it like it should be done. Do you realize that before 1900, all farmers were organic farmers? Stop and think about that and let that settle in for just a minute. Before 1900, all farmers were organic farmers. All the way back to the beginning of mankind, we've been organic farmers. So organic farming is not anything new. It's just that in our modern day age, so many chemicals got to be used on different crops and stuff like this that people got to not wanting to eat the products because of the chemicals. So thus, the quote-unquote new idea, organic farming, was born. Big joke. Organic farming's always been around. What happened was, after the wars, we had so many chemicals stockpiled. Lots of them were defoliants and all that kind of stuff that was used to, uh, you know, to take the leaves off the trees to expose enemy. Nerve gases and all this kind of stuff that was used during the World Wars. Uh, a lot used in Vietnam, Agent Orange, all this kind of stuff. And because of the large stockpile, these chemicals needed to be used. And believe it or not, a lot of these ended up being pesticides and things like that uh, that was used on crops. Thus was born the use of pesticides to control insects and crops and try to, try to produce mass farming. It was the beginning of the end for the small farmer. My dad used to tell me about how it was when he was a kid. They had brainwashed the people that far back in the 30s and the 40s into believing that chemicals were okay. My dad told me many times they would take arsenic and put it in a lady's, he called them step-ins, which we call them pantyhose today, and they would tie the end off on them or put them down the, toward the toe end, and they would walk on through the garden, and they would shake them like that, and that arsenic would go on top of their cucumber plants and stuff like that to keep the bugs off. They didn't think anything about it because they were told it was okay. The agriculture department, you know, said, hey, this is perfectly safe. And... Therefore, from that point forward, lots of people did not come to the realization that chemicals were that bad. Now, I grew up, my parents, my dad, he, he used seven dust, and, and I used it for many years when I was growing commercially. You know, I didn't think anything about it. I can well remember my father-in-law having corn harvested out of the field. It was un A lot of it had been shucked, I mean, uh, shelled off the cobs and had it in big containers and weevils began to get in it. And, and uh, I well remember him spreading it out on a giant concrete slab, spraying it with malathon to kill all the weevils in it and everything. So that, um, and using it for cattle feed, grinding it for grits and stuff like that. And being told that it had, that the malathon had a had an expiration time on it, that after so many days it was safe to eat. Where did all this come from? It came from corporations wanting to make big money at the expense of human health. And if you stop back and do your research, you'll realize that pre-1900, you hardly ever heard the word cancer mentioned at all. Now, it's not that it didn't exist, because it did exist, just very rare. Uh, my great, not my great-grandfather, yeah, my great-grandfather, he passed away uh, from eye cancer. He had eye cancer about 20 years. He's blind for the last part of his life. So it, it was back then. It did, it did happen. But not to the extent that it is today. Today, it was running rampant. And most of it is due to chemicals that are in foods. And the thing about it is, is uh, and this part I've never understood, is that Organic food has been made more expensive. Chemical-laden food has been made cheap. 
you would think to have to spray something with all these chemicals and everything and put all these fertilizers into it and all this kind of stuff would make it more expensive, but no, they made it cheaper than the organic stuff. Why? To destroy our health. That's why. So what is organic farming? What is real organic farming? That's the question we got to ask today. We ask ourselves uh, lots of questions. What is optimum soil fertility? That's probably the number one question that gets asked more than anything else out there. We wrestle with this all the time. Should I add bone meal? Should I add blood meal? Should I add phosphorus? What should I add? How much of it should I add? And at what point in the plant's life do I add it? These are all questions that we ask ourselves. Why? <laughs> because it's what we've been taught. That's the key. It's what we've been told that has to happen. Now, is, it, is there some truth in it? Yes, there is an element of truth in all those questions. And yet, we ask them, and we ask them, and we ask them. And we find out that there are no definite answers. That's the part that gets us. We are brought up today in a society to believe that when we ask a question, we should be able to get a real answer, and it should be able to, and, and look, universities and colleges and laboratories and all, they've come up with answers, and people flock right to it, because that's the way the human makeup is today. Let's look at farming in nature. How does farming take place in nature? Stop and think about it now. Now we're not talking about the garden now. We're talking about nature. How does farming happen in nature? Do trees in the wild, and we're talking about in the wild, out in the wild, do they flower too early? Do they get bit back by cold weather? Do they put on all new sprouts as like they do every spring and then all of a sudden they get bit back and killed back? It doesn't hardly ever happen in nature. Now the question we're going to ask is why? They have no spring damage, no frost damage, no cold damage. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why? There's lots of questions that have to be asked. Why does this happen? Despite lots of organic matter being in the soil, when the spring rains come, like I, tell you, like I said, they put on all these new sprouts and everything grows. But yet, the key factor is they hardly ever have to be pruned. They're usually self-pruning. Another, why? We have to ask ourselves the question, what is taking place that we're missing in nature that we're not comprehending in our own growing? The answer to perfect soil fertility in nature is, even though there's lots of organic matter there, There's no input of other things, such as blood meal, bone meal, phosphorus, all these other types of organic matters that people put into the soil doesn't happen in nature. But yet nature seems to do very well without all these things being added. So what is the key here? What is it that makes the soil so rich in nature that trees flourish, plants flourish, 
everything flourishes so well. Well, guys, the secret, and is in, I'm, I got a table here in front of me. The secret is in this right here. You know what that is? That's a leaf that falls off of a tree. The secret is in the leaves of the tree. As that tree grows, it pulls up vital nutrients and minerals from the ground, sugars and microorganisms and all these beneficial nutrients that this tree needs to grow, and it sends them out to the leaves, and the leaves stores all that. And in the fall, or we call it the autumn, all those beautiful colors that we look at are the fertilized for the future of that tree. Because see, those leaves fall and they fall right underneath that tree. And as they fall underneath that tree, right there on the ground where they're at, there's photosynthesis in the nutrients that takes place here. And these leaves all hold and contain that. And as they fall on the forest floor, year after year they layer. And as they layer, they begin to decompose. Now what is it about these leaves that's so great? They have minerals. There's three things that those leaves have that makes them such good fertilizer. They've had water. They've had sunlight, and they've had air. These three things are what every plant needs, whether it's a tree or whether it's a vegetable. No matter what it is, all three of them need that. They need water, sunlight, and air in order to be able to produce like they should produce. What about inorganic nutrients? and minerals that trees need. How do they accomplish that? You know, go, you go like, well, my plant's got to have, you know, it, it needs this or it needs that. It needs more zinc. It needs more, of, you know, boron. Well, all these things. My plant needs all these things. What about that? Well, if you dig below the leaves into the, in the, in the forest, you dig through the first layer, which is a dark, rich layer of leaf mold and it has a microbial smell to it if you've ever noticed what leaf mold when you dig it up and you like you can just smell it it's a microbial leaf mold i mean it's just it's living with organisms and as you begin to dig below that you come to a sand and rock level and what happens here is that layer of leaf mold begins to eat away at the rocks and the sand and stuff below it, extracting different minerals out of all of those things and breaking it down so that when the roots of the tree reach up into that leaf mold to feed, they're getting their vital nutrients and stuff like that from the leaf mold and from the dirt as the leaves in the, mic in the microbial nutrients in the soil begin to be uh, assimilated by the microorganisms in the soil. What we need to do is to apply this system to our gardens. We need to put the crop residue back into the soil so that the soil is, uh, the crops are able to feed off of the things that was growing there. We begin to do this on our homestead here. Um, you know, me, my, my heart disease has begun to increase somewhat here lately. Uh, it's getting a lot worse than what it was, thus limiting me a lot in what I can and can't do now. And as a result, it's caused me to rethink all this organic stuff because I've been doing pretty much organic and I do use some chemical fertilizers or synthetic should I say 
on large crops that I just don't have enough for in order to get up and have enough to feed animals and stuff like this. But gradually, Wanda and I are working on coming back to the roots of organic and true organic farming. So we want to put the crop residue back into the soil. And if we're going to add anything extra to the soil, what we need to do, and this is something I've got to actively get better at, I used to do a lot of it, is we've got to add grass clippings back to the garden. Now you don't want to do it when it's in seed stage. You want to get the grass clippings before they go to seed. A prime example of this was uh, back in 2012, uh, my wife had just passed away at that time. My mother and father needed me to help at their home, and well, I didn't have any reason to stay locked here, so I went to their house and stayed with them to help them out, because my mom couldn't drive, she'd had a stroke, and dad couldn't walk, he couldn't do anything. And while I was there, I asked them, I said, do y'all mind if I go get my tractor and bring to your property here, and plow the back part of the field up here behind the house and plant a garden? Well, of course, my mom and my dad were gardeners their whole life, so they didn't mind. But at that time, I began to have a lot of heart issues. My first time to ever have a heart problem in my life. I was in and out of the hospitals a lot. And because of that, I had no job, no income. My parents and them lived on a measly little Social Security check. So I said, you know what, it's going to be difficult to raise a garden because I don't have any money for fertilizer. And my dad would say, son, you can't raise a garden without that fertilizer. I said, dad, I've got to try. I'm a gardener. So I tilled the ground. I had to be very sparingly because I didn't have money to spend on diesel and stuff like that. So I just broke it up real good, right quick. And I took hand tools and laid the rows off, push hand tools, laid the rows off. But what I'd done was I come up with a thing, my mom and his property was so rich in grass. I had a lawnmower then it had a bag catcher on it to catch the caught the grass. I come up with the idea after looking at my daddy's bush hog sitting there, how it was all rusted out with grass piled up on top of it. I said, you know, that's gotta be nitrogen eating that metal out. And if I put this around my plants, at least they'll get some nitrogen. Maybe they'll grow. Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you that that grass clippings is all I used. I piled it six inches deep in that whole garden around all the plants and the middle of the rows everywhere. Not only did the garden have no weeds, that garden grew more vegetables than my parents had ever seen or I had ever seen. My daddy was amazed. At December, at Christmas, I was still picking butter beans, and there were frosts. And my dad said, how is it possible that you can pick a butter bean? That's a hot weather plant, son. I told him, I said, Dad, all I can attribute it to is that all the grass clippings on the ground is protecting the roots of those plants from getting too cold and making them die. And, and I don't understand why the frost ain't killing the leaves. I just don't understand it. That made a believer out of me. And I've always implemented those practices as much as I can. True organic farming is not about wood chips. It's not about rice bran, rice hulls, all these other things we try to amend into the soil to make the soil rich. It's not about adding all that organic matter into the soil. That's not what true organic farming is really all about. Organic matter comes in all types of different qualities. The worst mistake we can make organic farming is to go and add a bunch of organic matter to soil and put that soil out of balance. And that is what happens with so many people, including myself. We go and we add all this organic matter into soil. And then we sit back and we like scratching our head. I've done all this organic stuff. I've added bone meal. I've added blood meal. I've added, you know, 
phosphorus. I've added all this stuff. Wood chips, all these things. And my plants just still are not producing like they should. It's because we've taken the soil that was there and we've made it out of balance. You see, in organic farming, to, to make soil where it's not balanced, it throws the microorganisms in the soil totally out of balance. And by doing that, you're basically, now this, this may sound horrible, but you're basically poisoning your soil. You're setting your soil up for disease because you've taken it completely and made it out of balance. And I know that may be hard to understand, but it's actually the truth. Organic farming is not a technique that you learn from a book. It's not a technique that you learn from somebody. To learn true organic farming, you must first study nature. Nature holds all the secrets to true organic farming. Go out into the pristine woods that's been non-touched by man and look around. No one has fertilized it. No one has planted it. No one has tilled it. No one has added anything to it, and yet it flourishes. Once you learn that nature is the greatest teacher of organic farming, my friends, at that point, organic farming becomes easy. We've just got to believe. And we've got to get to that point in our life. And we've got to stop thinking like Big Ag wants us to think. Organic farming truly has to take place. You know what the thing I like about it the most is? Farming based on nature costs almost nothing. That's where I'm trying to get to in my life, on my homestead is to organic farm and it costs me nothing to do. Not having to run to the store and buy the bags of bone meal, not going to the store having to buy the blood meal, not having to buy the phosphorus, not having to buy all these amenities, the bags of zinc, the bags of you know calcium and all these types of things. But learning how nature does it and implementing those same principles into my garden. Once we do those things, large yields, high quality fruits and vegetables become easy to do. And once they become easy, gardening organically becomes a blessing and it becomes easy to do. And it becomes a joy because we're not spending a ton of our hard-earned money to create our food system. Now, don't spaz. Don't spaz about what I'm talking about here today. Give, your time, give yourself time to think about it. And I think if you'll give yourself some time to think about it, you'll come to the realization, I'm telling you the truth. It's been a little hard for me to accept because... I've always bought stuff to put into my soil. I don't use cattle manure anymore because my cows ended up having some graze on. I got some hay that had graze on in it. We're working to get all that off our land now and get our land back cleaned up again. And once we do that, and I get these stalls all cleaned out and everything's cleaned up and, and, and gone, the hay I use now has not had any graze on on it or Remedy or 2,4-D or any of this kind of stuff then I can begin to reuse my cattle manure again and my compost and I can begin to use my chicken. I, I, I do use my chicken manure. I compost it. So guys, we're going to look into even some more stuff in the next videos about how to make those nutrients happen. How to make nutrient-dense fertilizers from nature. 
and not have to spend a lot of money going out buying fertilizers every year. Because hey, if an LCE happens and you can't get to the store, if they shut us down again and we can't go to the store and buy stuff, we should still be able to farm. Do you realize that our ancient forefathers, they didn't go to stores and buy stuff. They farmed. The poorest of people farmed, and they grew great crops. It wasn't about how much money you had. It was about, hey, what did you learn from nature? So guys, stay with me. we got more videos coming in the future. And hopefully, as we make these new videos, and I show you some techniques and explain some more things about organic farming, you'll finally come to the realization, just like I did, that the organic farming of today is not true organic farming. Organic farming in its truest form goes back to nature where it originated. Thank you guys from Deep South Homestead.